Or if you're starting a new business, you have to decide the legal form of ownership and what's best for you and that business. So do you want to own the business yourself and operate as a sole proprietorship? Do you want to share ownership, operate as a partnership or a corporation or a limited liability company? And we're going to discuss all the pros and cons of those types of ownership. And there are some others that are a little probably too esoteric for, for this group. But before we discuss those pros and cons, let's address some of the questions that you yourself need to ask in choosing the appropriate legal form for your business. So in setting up your business, do you want to minimize the cost of getting started? Uh, do you hope to avoid complex government regulations and reporting requirements? Now, I work pretty closely with Ronnie from time to time and some of the people in, in the, the program. And their first question is, well, what is that going to cost? And, and I understand that. So let's answer that question. Uh, it costs you $0 to form a sole proprietorship because you just go into business. It costs you probably under $100 to form a partnership. Corporation, there's a filing fee of about $300. And the limited liability company is the most expensive. It's $350 in filing fees. And then depending on the county in which you are filing and going to do business, anywhere from about $480 to $2,200, because you have to publish the fact that you're forming your limited liability company. Now, you know, it's obviously cheaper to publish in Ulster County than it is to publish in Manhattan. Question number two, so that deals with costs. Question number two, how much control would you like over your business? How much responsibility are you willing to share? How much of the profits are you willing to share? Do you want to avoid taxes? All these entities are taxed differently. Some of them actually can be taxed the same if you make the right elections, we'll get to that. Do you have the skills to run your business? Is it too complex for you to just be the only person in charge? Um, are you likely to get along with other owners? This is a personality issue. And I will tell you that I do a lot of business divorce and they are at least as ugly as regular matrimonial divorces because people are tied in financially, their businesses are tied together, their lives are tied together. So are you the kind of person that can actually get along with everybody else and mold yourself to dealing with partners? I'm lucky enough, I have a partner. We've been partners 25 years. We haven't killed each other yet. May, may happen soon as we get older, but not yet. Um, survivability, that's a very interesting question. Do you want your business to survive beyond you? Is it important? You know, I, I have a number of friends who are in service businesses and the business is them. So it's very hard for them to sell that business. They can't really pass it along to their children. Do you want to have something that has longevity beyond your retirement or your death? What are the financing needs? How much can you afford to finance it? How do you plan to finance it? Very important questions because businesses run on money and the various forms give you various op different opportunities to obtain financing. And finally, how much personal exposure are you willing to accept? That's, an, that's a key issue because in certain form, business forms, you have a lot of personal exposure and you have personal exposure for the partners. And in other business forms, if you do it correctly, you have virtually none. So here's the good, here's the good news. There's no right answer. No single form of what we're going to discuss today will give you everything you're looking for. You're going to make some trade-offs. Each option has advantages, disadvantages. Your job is to decide what works best for you. So we're gonna dive into it. We're gonna dive into it with a little story. Once upon a time, there was a guy named Bob. That's Bob. Say hi, Bob. Uh, Bob really liked chocolate as a kid. I mean, he had an almost unhealthy relationship. And that continued into Bob's adulthood. <laughs> and, and every single day, like most of us, Bob would go to work. And every single day, Bob would come home and pass a candy store on his way to and from work. And eventually, Bob decided to quit his job. There's the candy store. And he buys the candy store. So at that point in time, what form of business is Bob operating? Anybody want to jump in? Sole proprietorship. Okay. Sole proprietorship. Correct. Sole proprietorship. So m many, many small businesses start a sole proprietorship and then move into a different form of a partnership, a corporation, or an LLC as the business grows. You don't have to do it that way. 
somehow, sometimes it just happens. It happens because, as I said earlier, it costs you zero dollars to start a sole proprietorship. You, you don't want to hire a lawyer. You don't want to hire an accountant. But you don't have to start that way, but many do. And I use a candy store for a very specific reason, because in the old days when I was a kid, candy stores were probably mostly sole proprietorships. And that'll become interesting later on, on when we get to corporations on how candy store owners used to treat the candy store. So in a sole proprietorship, it's pretty simple. You make all the, des- the important decisions. Matter of fact, you make every decision uh, and you're responsible for all the day-to-day activities. So you're selling the candy, buying the candy, stocking the shelves. Maybe you have some employees. Uh, in exchange, you assume all the responsibility and in exchange, you get all the money. Profits and money that you earn in connection with the operation of the sole proprietorship is personal income. There's no separate income tax. There's no separate federal or state taxes. That's it. It's you running your business. Those are the advantages. Any questions? Okay. But there are disadvantages. For a lot of people, sole proprietorship just doesn't work. The flip side of having complete and utter control of what you're doing is that you have to supply all of the talent necessary to make the business a success. So if you're a sole proprietorship and your business gets to a certain size, you need to understand how to market the product, understand how to sell the product, understand how to acquire the product. If you're a manufacturer, make the product, then you're going to need a financial side. That's a lot to ask one person to do. I mean, my firm, we've got people who handle, we have partners who handle different aspects just because it's too much for one person to do. I, I kind of oversee everything, but I have, I have partners delegated responsibilities because it becomes too much. Um, so can you provide all the necessary skills and talents? Most people can't. Um, when you're gone, business dies. When owner dies, when you're gone, the business is over. And as I said, very difficult to sell a sole proprietorship because in many, in many ways, you are tied to the business. You are the business. Um, you're self-financed. You have to rely on your own resources for financing because the business is you. And, and a question came up earlier, Ronnie, last week, and you know about it, about someone who was doing business under a certain name and they couldn't get the name of the Secretary of State. And now they've started their business under one name and they've built a reputation over a period of years, but they can't incorporate under that name. And we had to come up with a novel solution to help, help that person solve that problem. But she's using all of her own resources. So money, money you borrow as a sole proprietor is money you borrow personally. It's not borrowed through a corporation. It's you. And you bear unlimited liability for any losses incurred by the business. So let me say that again. Unlimited liability. And somebody out there may be thinking, well, what does that really mean? It means if the business incurs a debt or suffers a catastrophe, somebody gets hurt on your premises, or you cause an injury to somebody, you are personally responsible. As a sole proprietor, you put all of your personal assets, bank accounts, investment accounts, car, house, on the line for the sake of your business. Now, you can lessen that with insurance, but there's only so much insurance that you can buy, and there are only so many people. I'm just looking at the chat. There yes. are only, um, I, can't, I can't actually, Leslie, run the chat. And no, the, we'll, we'll do that for you. Okay, so if there's a question through the chat, please ask it. You can we'll lessen go. insurance, but it's a big ask to get the insurance necessary to cover that. So are there any questions in the chat? Okay, great. So we're going to move on. Let me just get my... So Bob is so successful that his friend Steve wants to join the business. So there's Bob and there's Steve. And now they're working together in the candy store them in there and having done absolutely nothing other than go into business together does anybody want to tell me or take a stab at what form of an entity business a business entity bob and steve have formed a partnership you are you've heard this lecture before it's not fair but okay (laughs) partnership yep so as it says on the on the on the screen a partnership is uh, a business owned jointly by two or more people uh for profit So Ronnie and I can form a partnership simply by starting to work together, 
and dividing our profits and our losses. You don't have to file anything, although you usually would file a certificate of an assumed name because you're rarely going to do, do business under the Randy, uh, Anthony and Ronnie partnership. A couple of fun facts, about 10% of U.S. businesses are partnerships. Uh, most of them are very small. Some of them are very large. So what comes to mind are the four public accounting for, firms, Deloitte, PwC, Ernst & Young, KPMG, were all partnerships the last time I looked. Um, it's a little more complex to set up a partnership than it is to go into business as a sole proprietor, but it's still relatively easy. easy. Um, my suggestion is, is if you're entering into a partnership, you really should have a written partnership agreement. And that's where you end up retaining an attorney to make sure that the partnership agreement sets forth all the things that are necessary to prevent you from having issues with your partner later on. So Ronnie and I don't have a in 1987, you said this, and in 1979, I said that, and here's where we are. It's all written down, so professionals can help you resolve those issues. Um, I think most professionals, I know if you came to our firm, we would probably dissuade you from trying to be a partnership unless there was a real, real important reason for it, and we would push you into another um, form of ownership, but being a partnership is fine. Um, Why would you dissuade people? I know why, but let's see. You know why. Well, we're going to get to that. Let me hit the okay. other side. So, oh, by the way, the written part, the last piece of that slide, the written partnership agreement is usually necessary for the bank and for landlords. They want to see that you're actually a partnership and not just two sole proprietors who are pretending to be a partnership. I see. So, okay. So there are advantages and disadvantages to being a partner, right? Um, it brings together a diverse group of people. Ronnie and I have different talents. We have different different capabilities. We could run the business a little more efficiently, perhaps, if we can have a, a nice synergy. Uh, financing is easier. Now you're relying on Ronnie's financing, Ronnie's resources and my resources, not just mine or hers. Um, partners not only contribute funds to the business, but you know they can get, they can pool their resources to get loans. Uh, continuity doesn't have to be a problem because if one of us dies or leaves, partnership agreement can explain that the partnership will survive and continue. Uh, the negatives. So yeah, it's first. The big negative is we still have unlimited liability. So there's, there's your answer, Ronnie. We still are responsible for all the debts of the partnership. So it works like this. Let's say, for example, that the partnership uh, has, has a loss, a catastrophic loss. Somebody gets injured. If the partnership assets aren't sufficient to pay that, that obligation, if it's beyond any insurance and there's not enough assets in the partnership, the personal assets of the partners come into play. I don't like that. And I don't think anybody on this call would like that. So you say to yourself, why does a company like PwC or KPMG, why are they acting as a partnership? Well, they're so enormous and so self-insured, they're self-insured, and what I mean by that is their deductible is in the millions of dollars. They're so gigantic that the likelihood of them having a loss that's not covered by insurance, not covered by the assets of those entities is, is almost, it's insignificant. It's impossible. Uh, I've done a lot, of, I've had a lot of litigation against all four of those accounting firms, and I will tell you they have virtually unlimited resources. So if they screw up somebody's tax return or even some corporation's tax return and they have a $50 million loss, it's not a problem for them. If Ronnie and I are running our candy store and we have a $50,000 loss, it might be a real problem for us. Um, the other thing about being a partner is you have to share in decision-making. Some people aren't comfortable with that. Some people want to run the show. Uh, partners, is that partners have differences of opinion on uh, how to run businesses. Disagreements can escalate to the point where people want to leave. And then if you don't have your partnership agreement in place, a partner leaves and the partnership dissolves. And what do you have? You have debts, you have liabilities, but you don't have a business. Um, partners also share profits. And if Ronnie is greedy or Bob or Steve are greedy or Anthony is greedy, they don't want to share profits. And, and an issue that always comes up, and this is true even in in, um, in the case of corporations and limited liability companies, people, are, oh, people always think they're worth more 
than perhaps their partner perceives. So if everybody feels like they're being awarded according to their efforts and what they've done, that's great. If it's not, that's a problem. And that's where I've seen a lot of, a lot of partnerships, corporations, small closely held corporations and limited liability companies have issues because usually it's Leslie and Ronnie and April and Anthony and we're working and suddenly somebody decides Anthony's not working as hard as he used to or as much as he used to and he shouldn't get a quarter, he should get a he should get 15% and we should divide the other 10%. And that's a bitter pill for people to swallow. More often than not, uh, partners forget that in that in our little four-person partnership, April put in all the money to get us started. And Leslie added something and Anthony added something and Ronnie added something. But Leslie, April put in all the money. And after a few years pass, people forget that April put in all the money and say, well, April shouldn't get as much. Well, you got here because of April. And that's where a partnership agreement helps you avoid some of those issues. But even with partnership agreements, you can have that issue if people stop working or start perceiving that the other people aren't work, other partners aren't working as hard. Uh, so while I've, you know, painted kind of a negative picture. It was particularly appealing, partnership was particularly appealing to Ben Cohen and Jerry Greenfield, who formed Ben and Jerry's. Uh, that business started as a partnership because it was cheap and they could f f combine their resources and use their skills. And as friends, they trusted each other. So they were not reluctant to hold each other responsible or be worried about one would do something with the other. That's a, that's a major success story for a partnership. Um, as I said, it's unlimited. You have unlimited liability. I'm just running through my notes here because I jumped around a little bit. We do have a question. That's fantastic. Oh, last, last point, and then we can have the question to move on. Um, partnerships are better situated to obtain capital than sole proprietorships, but getting really large amounts of long-term capital is very difficult for partnerships of a certain size because they generally don't have enough assets for collateral. And now you're back to looking at the partner's personal assets in order to fund the business. So what's the question? Oh, so because Steve and Bob were so successful, well, hold on, I'm at, I'm at the wrong slide. There we go. So partnership agreement, let's talk about that just briefly. And I think it'll show you why it's a little bit more important. Partnership agreements, everybody thinks it, it, they mostly run, and this is true of limited liability company operating agreements and shareholder agreements. So what I'm about to say applies to those entities also. Most clients come and they think that this, this agreement will set forth what Leslie does, what April does, what Anthony does, what Ronnie does. And yeah, it can, but it really deals with the bigger ticket items that are the, the real problem. How much did we each put in? How are we going to divide the income? How are we going to divide losses? Yes, who does what, when they do it? How many of us does it take to make a decision? Is it any one of us? Is it any two of us? Probably not. It's three quarters of us. What decisions are going to be unanimous? Are we shutting the doors? That's usually going to be a, either super majority or a unanimous decision. Um, are, are we merging with somebody else? Are we bringing somebody else in as a partner? Those aren't decisions that are lightly made. And if you don't write them down, you're not lost because New York State has the, the Partnership Act, but New York State doesn't really care about Ronnie and Anthony and Leslie. Uh, it cares about New York State and avoiding chaos. So there is the Limited Liability Company Act. There is the Business Corporation Act, which has been enacted for hundreds of years. And it's designed to prevent chaos. It's not designed to deal with our personal issue. So April may have issues that she has that are personal to her that she wants addressed. Leslie may have the same. Anthony may have the same. And we try to reach an accommodation. I have a client right now. We're doing a limited liability company agreement. And partners are situated differently. I have partners in their 30s. And I have partners in their 60s. Everybody's got a different view. When do I get out? How do I get out? Can I tr who can I transfer my interests to? Those are issues that the partnership agreement should cover. The big issue, and that's you know, bullet point four, is 
the conditions under which you can sell an interest in the company. And that applies again to LLCs and corporations. And I'll tell you a quick story. Uh, we have a, we had a potential client, but they, they didn't hire us, but potential client, they've been in business over a hundred years. And I was talking to the president. And I asked them if they had partners, if they had board of directors meetings and shareholders meetings. Yes, 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 yes. Do you have a shareholders agreement? No. Well, why not? Well, we never thought we needed one. I said, well, what happens if your aunt Gladys wants to transfer her shares to the universal you know, Unitarian Universalist Church? She can do it. And now we'll call them the Smiths. The business that's been owned by only Smiths for over 100 years is owned by the Universalist Unitarian Church, at least a piece of it is. And that entity has all the rights that you would have as a Smith. He stops, he grabs my arm, he says, I do have an Aunt Gladys, and she wants to transfer her shares to the University of Michigan. I said, okay, that's, that's why you need a, a shareholders agreement to prevent that. You want to be able to, in mostly small, small businesses, you want to have a say in who your partners are. You want to have a say in who you do business with. You want to have a say in if this business continues and you're leaving it to your family, who's going to be running it? Who's going to be involved in it? So partnership agreement helps with that. It keeps, I like to say, it keeps the cats in the yard. Um, conditions for dissolving. How do we just shut the doors? You want that laid out, right? You want to be able to understand what your rights are, that Leslie just can't leave and say, all right, business is over. Maybe three of the four of us have to say, say the business is over. If Leslie leaves, the business continues. Uh, and finally, how do we settle our disputes? Do we go to mediation first? Do we go to arbitration? Do we go to court? Uh, do we fix that? How do we fix valuation? Really important issue. And that's an issue a lot of people struggle with all the time because how do you value the entity? And when do you value the entity? And under what circumstances is that valuation impacted? So for example, if Anthony, if the partnership agreement says, if you do something that involves moral turpitude, right? Or, or you get arrested for a felony. Maybe our partnership agreement says, well, Anthony gets bought out at a specific valuation. And I'm not talking necessarily a price. I'm talking about a methodology. And because he got arrested for a felony, he only gets 50% of that over five years. Whereas Ronnie wants to leave and retire, we do the valuation and she gets all of it over six years or three years, whatever you want to agree on. My point really is, and I think this illustrates it well, the Uniform Partnership Act for New York doesn't do any of that. It just tells you what happens if somebody leaves. It doesn't tell you how you should behave as it relates to your partners. Going on to the next slide. So Bob and Steve become wildly successful and their friends all want in and Bob and Steve let them into the business. So you want to show off, Ronnie, what kind of business... It's a trick question. What kind of business entity could this be? This could be a corporation. Right. Or it could be an LLC. Right. Um, or it could be for... just a bigger partnership. Oh, it could be a bigger partnership. Yes. Right. I wasn't but, sure what uh, you were going for. <laughs> yeah, for my purpose is it's, it's going to be a corporation. And this is the, this is the road that most of you will travel uh, this is the road that you're probably most familiar with. Your friends in business are familiar with. Uh, a corporation is different from a sole proprietor and a partnership in one very important way. A corporation is a separate legal entity. It's a person under the eyes of the law. So Ronnie Rosen, Inc. and Ronnie Rosen are two different people under the eyes of the law, as long as Ronnie Rosen, the actual human being, operates Ronnie Rosen, Inc. correctly. And that means that Ronnie Rosen, Inc. can enter into contracts, buy and sell property, sue and be sued, be held responsible for its actions. And yes, indeed, it's taxed separately from Ronnie Rosen. Unless, and we'll get to the unless in a minute. Once businesses reach a substantial size, corporation is usually the way they go. Um, comp banks are comfortable with it. Lenders are comfortable with it. Other people who are in business are usually corporations and comfortable with it. It's, it's, it's relatively cheap to do. 
Uh, there are downsides we'll get to in a minute. I want to go through because a lot of people have some confusion and, and Ronnie, every time we do this, there's a little bit of confusion because the nature of the phones folks on this call is small business. So maybe you have two or three partners in our example, we have Ronnie, Anthony, April, and Leslie. You're going to see that we're all in order to comply with the corporate law in New York and in most states, we're going to have to wear very, very distinct hats at very, very distinct times and behave that way. When in reality, we're just making candy and selling candy. So corporations are owned by shareholders. Many of you own shares of corporations, I'm sure. Um, how much of the corporation you own is dependent on how many shares are issued and how many shares that you own. So if there's 100 shares issue and you own 30 shares, you own 30% of the corporation. Um, the shareholders have their job, which is mostly to elect the board of directors. And the board of directors has its job, which is mostly to oversee major policy decisions made by the board, right, made for the company. Um, the, the problem in, in our scenario is, and I apologize because I'm looking over to see if I'm getting any reaction. <laughs> the, the, the problem in our scenario is that we're not AT&T, we're not Google, we're not Amazon, where we're a public company and there are hundreds of faceless shareholders. In our scenario, there's just four of us. So when are Ronnie and Anthony and Leslie and April a shareholder? And when are they an officer? And when are they a director? And when are they just working their butts off to make candy? That's where the lines blur a little bit. Unfortunately, and we'll get to that a little bit later, that's what's required. You need to keep those lines unblurred. But back to our slide, and then we'll move to the next one, if, unless we have any questions. Creditors, the advantages of a corporation is creditors, if you do it correctly, creditors can only collect debts from the corporation, except in very limited circumstances. Now, you need to form the corporation with the New York Secretary of State. It's easy. Um, we do it. We pass that cost directly through. Or you can go on the Secretary of State's website and do it. It costs virtually nothing. The name has to have the words corporation, corp, Inc., limited, LTD in it. Uh, Ronnie, you and I had a very interesting scenario recently where, as I said, someone was doing business under a name. It's a pretty cool name. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to incorporate because it was, it was time. It was three or four years later, and it was time to incorporate. Unfortunately, their name was unacceptable to the New York Secretary of State. There are certain names that are absolute no-nos. Um, I won't use the name of this one entity, but I'll use Well, you can say that it was she was calling herself some kind of a museum, but she really wasn't a museum. Right. She was a retail company saying that she's a museum. The New York Secretary of State says, no, no, no. Museums can only be chartered by the state education department. So she wasn't a museum, so she couldn't be chartered by the state education department. I've had clients who want to be the Ronnie and Anthony finance company but we're not in the finance business. Those have to be chartered by the banking department. Secretary of State will reject those. The Secretary of State will also reject any name that is too close to another corporate name. So although human beings, there can be dozens of Ronnie Rosens in the world, but I know there's only really one. Um, you can't have Ronnie Rosen Inc., Ronnie Rosen Limited, Ronnie Rosen loves Ronnie Rosen. They've gotta be different names so that there's no confusion. So you can go on the New York State Secre New York Secretary of State Division of Corporations website, and there's a little link, and you can check to see if those names are available. You put in the name of the corporation that you like, and if it comes back with three or four names that are similar, then you have to start thinking about whether or not those names are acceptable. Someone out there is saying, but there's, you know, there's Acme everything. Well, yeah, there are, but it's Acme development. It's Acme construction. It's Acme... Um, drywall. There's, there's enough to make them be different. So that's that's that point. That's that issue there. Uh, any questions? Race through these a little bit. As we said, okay. shareholders elect the board of directors. Usually they appoint auditors. They amend the articles of incorporation, so they change names. They approve mergers. Again, why do you need a shareholders agreement? What is it? It's the same thing as a partnership agreement, only for a corporation. Directors. Directors are elected annually. They, they, they elect officers. So shareholders elect directors, directors elect officers. 
Officers run the company. Directors deal with the big ticket items, okay? Um, who gets compensated? Are we merging? Are we selling? <laughs> what are we doing? They set the day-to-day. -day. Technically, and if you look down, it's 0.5, I believe. Technically, they're not involved in the day-to-day, -day, but in our example, well, the only people in the company are Anthony, Ronnie, Leslie, and April. When we're shareholders, when are we directors, when are we officers, those lines begin to blur. But unfortunately, New York State doesn't say, oh, you're small, the rules don't apply. New York State says you need to act like a corporation. So Leslie, Anthony, Ronnie, and April will have to have an annual shareholders meeting. We'll have to have at least an annual board of directors meeting. We'll have to go through the motions, even though it's stupid. And it becomes more stupid and somebody over there is shaking their head when I'm the only shareholder. I'm having a meeting with myself. Yes, you are. You are. Because New York State requires it. You want indicia that you're acting like a corporation, that it has a separate legal entity. Who should be on the board? People you trust. You should have a board. It should be an odd number of people so that you don't have any deadlock. And it should be people you trust. If there's three of you, great. If there's four of you, great. If in our, in our example, there's four shareholders, four board members, I would say pick a fifth, pick a neutral, pick someone who can sit there and, and not take sides and really give you a good business value, a business appraisal of what's going on. Okay. More about the Wait. board. Oh, go ahead. Okay, no question. Go ahead. No, I wasn't going to have a question, but Woody Allen famously said that he formed a board with his family and they voted him out. You know what? That's happened. <laughs> it's happened. I mean, when you have family owned businesses, and I have, I have a number of those where we've got 15, they're in business about 80 years and they've got fifth generation. They've got 15 or 20 either individuals or trusts that are all family related all of that, you know, when I was nine and he was seven, dad got me a remote control car and he broke it and he's been screwing my stuff up ever since. That's there. And that's, by the way, a true story. I had guys who, were, who owned diamond mines in South Africa tell me that in their 40s. But that's there. And that's endemic to how small family-owned businesses run. And what I tell those people is, especially the next generation, it's not just about running the business. It's about running the family. Okay. Officers, officers are responsible for running the day-to-day, -day, corporate governance, main, main, maintaining the records. Here's where I really want to get. Uh, benefits of a corporation, limited liability. Unless you screw this up, you are not going to have a scenario where you are going to be personally responsible for the debts of the company, unless you've signed on as a personal guarantor. Financial resources. It's a lot easier for corporations to raise money by selling stock. It's a lot easier for corporations to borrow money because banks are comfortable with corporate, the corporate identity. They become a little less comfortable and it, when they're dealing with sole proprietorships and partnerships. And it's funny because you could see a scenario where there'd be a very robust sole proprietorship. Very wealthy person just decides for whatever insane reason, I'm not going to be a corporation wants to get a loan from the bank. Sure, the bank's going to make that loan, but they, having represented them for years and years, are very comfortable with what they understand. Corporations have specialized management, right? You've got people, hopefully, who know what they're doing as you grow, who are taking on different roles. So eventually, in our little corporation, the four of us have to hire somebody to be a, a ch chief financial officer because we can't, the company's gotten big enough that we can't actually handle that ourselves. And I've seen companies fail or struggle because they haven't filled in their roles because the four of us believe we can do everything. Pushes you in that direction. Continuity and transferability. Somebody ha something happens to a shareholder, your shareholder's agreement is going to say whether their shares get bought, bought out, whether they get inherited, but the business essentially, in theory, can last forever. And think about some of the huge corporations that have been around for a few hundred years the shareholders have died and died off and changed. The board of directors has changed and the corporate and the offices have changed, but the corporation is an immortal entity. So you can transfer those assets, your interest. It's easier to do that. 
you can continue the con the, the um you, you have con you have business continuity i'm sorry I'm trying to jump around a little bit and the last is credibility i think the credibility really overlays the corporate the corporate identity because people who act like a corporation seem to be more serious or appear to be more serious or look like they know what they're doing um, there's always a tension between the officers and the shareholders. Officers want to further their career, as you get bigger. Shareholders want to make more money. Um, three, the last three are really what I'd like to talk about. It can be a little expensive to operate a corporation because it is paper intensive. You have to hold shareholders meetings. You have to have minutes for the shareholders meetings. Lawyers usually prepare those. Although I have some share clients where I just give them the form, they fill it out, and they give it back to me and I just keep it. Um, you have to have board of directors meetings. You have to give notices of the board of directors meetings. You have to give notices of the shareholders meetings. You have to have minutes of your board of directors meetings. You have board resolutions. The corporation, no, the corporation has to do that in order to protect the owners, the shareholders from being responsible for its debts. If you don't do that, then someone says, but Ronnie, Anthony, you operated like you were Ronnie and Anthony. And that's where my candy store um, analogy comes in. You go into the candy store and you buy a pack of smokes, right? You buy gum and some can and, and some and some candy, and you give the candy store owner ten bucks. And he looks in the till and he says, "I don't have the change." He reaches in his pocket, he pulls out five, and he makes change for you out of his own money. Ronnie's shaking. Her. That's a sole proprietor. There's nothing wrong with that. You do that in a corporation. You've told the world, yeah, we're kind of a corporation. There's really no dividing line. So when you sue the corporation, you should sue me too. Now it's under very simple, it's, it, there's very strict guidelines under which you can do that. But all of that paperwork I'm talking about is basically your first line of defense to show the world we act like it's a corporation. Um, there's more, a little bit more regulation on certain corporations. And then you have the possibility of double taxation. So as a sole proprietor, right, you are taxed individually. Corporations are taxed separately. So in a, in a corporation, unless you make what's called an S-corp election, the corporation's profits are taxed at the corporate rate. And when the corporation gives money to you as the shareholder, you pay taxes on that money. Except the IRS gave us this wonderful thing called an S-corp election. S-corps don't have to pay taxes like a regular corporation. All the money, while you are a corporation and you still have all of those protections, all of that money flows, losses and profits flows through your own personal tax return. So there is no double taxation. The requirements are there, they're simple. You have to be a domestic, meaning United States corporation. You have to have shareholders who are certain individual, individuals and trust in the states. You can't be a resident alien shareholder. You can't have a partnership. This is a people's, the people's corporation. You have to have less than 100 shareholders. You can only have one class of stock and you can't be a certain kind of business. S-corp elections have to take place, I think within the first 90 days. Um, you should talk to your accountant about doing that if you're thinking of forming a corporation. If you make an S-corp election, you're good. If you don't make an S-corp ele election and the time expires, you can't make an S-corp election, which really? means you that's correct, which means you'll be taxed as a C-Corp, which is a regular straight-up corporation. Think Amazon, AT&T, Ford. Um, this slide is not a mistake. It doesn't have anything on it because none of you are ever going to create a C-Corp. I have a startup right now that is a C-Corp. Why, Anthony, is it a C-Corp? Because it's starting out with like $100 million in financing and funding. It's not ever going to be an S Corp. It was always going to be a C Corp. So we started it that way. For you, S Corp election, pay taxes once, tell Uncle Sam, see you later. If you get big enough, God bless you. You can always revoke your S Corp election and be taxed as a C Corp. But talk to your accountants about how they want to handle your taxes if you're forming a corporation. Ongoing requirements, I'm going to rip through really quick. Yeah, because have, we definitely want to hit the LLCs. So yeah, go and stay, stay, hang on, people. I'm it's rolling. coming. You have go to ahead. do all of these things. 
You have to hold the organizational meeting. You have to adopt the bylaws. You have to issue shares. You have to adopt banking resolutions. I'm not going to read them all. You have to do all of those things in order to be a valid corporation. And again, are the New York State Department of Tax, uh, Department of Corporations Police going to come and look at you? No, they don't care. Who's going to care is you if and when you don't have any of these indicia that show you're a corporation. Same thing, corporate governance. We're going to stack up pages and pages of documents, redundant, silly documents. Do we really need that? Yes, you do, to show you are a corporation. Okay, some of this, now Now the real, real secret is, some of this, and I'm only three slides, two slides away, some right. of this is, can be done by consent. So we don't have to have a meeting. The four of us consent, we sign a consent, we agree to it. One of the first things I ever did as a lawyer, really literally one of the first things was recreate years of board minutes for a corporation that had never done board minutes. Why did I have to do that? They were trying to sell. Buyers are very sophisticated, usually more sophisticated than sellers. Buyers want to see that you've done all the little, simple, easy things correctly. And if you don't have the board minutes, if you don't have consents, if you don't have notices, they get a little nervous. What else didn't you do correctly? So my very first job 100 years ago was to create board minutes. We're buying a piece of machinery. Okay, we're doing board minutes approving that. We sold the building. We're doing board minutes approving that. The banks that want to loan you money want to see this. They want to see that you're buttoned up. Okay. Now, this is my favorite slide because Ronnie loves LLCs. If a corporation- I'm, I'm sorry, a... Anthony. Anthony, yep. before, you, before you go into LLCs, uh, sure. we had someone who asked two questions. Sure. Actually, the same person asked two. The first one is, what is the minimum age for board, um, for board <laughs> members? And the second one she just asked is, is a lawyer someone that can guide you in meeting your corporate annual paperwork? This is just in case she has to leave. So question number one is 18, right? You have to be a legal age to be a board member. <clears throat> the real answer is you don't want somebody on the board who's wielding some control, uh, who's not an experienced business person or who's basically just a kid. So my advice in that scenario, if you need to put your children on the board, maybe you create what's called an advisory board. They don't really have voting rights, but they get to sit there. We've done that with some of the older corporations that we have where they're trying to get the next generation ready. But in a pinch, sure, you can put your kids 18 years old and over on it. And a lawyer is probably the only person who can help you navigate the corporate documentation. Your accountant's not going to do it. You could try to do it yourself. Uh, when you form a corporation, you get this thing called the Black Beauty. I wish I had it. It's a little corporate kit and it's got bylaws in it. It's got all these documents in it. And invariably, when you ask somebody to give it to you, it's, it's blank. Uh, lawyers can do it. They can do it. Rel most lawyers, we can do it relatively inexpensively. Um, and I'm not talking about thousands of dollars. I'm talking about hundreds of dollars a year just to get all the forms filled, get all the form forms filled out because a lot of them, as I said earlier, are redundant. In our scenario, Ronnie, Anthony, Leslie, and April are electing ourselves to the board of directors every single year. We're electing ourselves as president, secretary, vice president, and treasurer every single year. It's, it's 15 minutes worth of work, 20 minutes worth of work. It's a few hundred dollars, but it keeps you compliant. And it makes me crazy, as Ronnie knows, why people don't do it. Okay, can we move on? Because I'm in the home stretch. Great. If a corporation and a partnership had a baby, its name would be LLC. Because you are going to get the best of both worlds. It combines the pass-through taxation, like a partnership or an S-corp, with the limited liability of a corporation. It's not a corporation. Okay? It's a limited liability company. You, there are certain other requirements, as you remember from slide like two. It's a little bit more expensive to form because you have to publish it. But LLCs have become just the darling child of the corporate world. Um, most small businesses I've seen now are forming LLCs. 
And the reasons for that are very simple. Um, you can have an unlimited number of members. You do have the flow through taxation, right? You've got, you can be taxed as a sole proprietor, a partnership, a C Corp, an S Corp. You're protected from most liability. Obviously, if you do something on your own that damages an individual, just the fact that you're a limited liability member isn't going to help you, but you've got that protection that you don't have in, um, in a sole proprietorship okay. partnership. The, the thing I like about it, and that works really, really well, and why many people gravitate to it is in a corporation, if the four of us own it 25% each, that's how profits and losses have to be distributed. Every one of the shareholders gets their actual percentage profits and losses. In an LLC, you can own a percentage that's different from how you share the profits and losses. So let's make it simple. Excuse me, let's make it simple. Ronnie and I are the two members of an LLC. We each own 50% of it. But Ronnie does all the work, so we agree to say that she's going to get 75% of the revenue and I'm going to get 25% of it. When we sell it, if we sell it, we each get 50% because that's what we own. But in terms of revenue, Ronnie's getting much more than I am. It lets you play with it. Bear in mind, LLC members can't collect wages. We get around that by giving you what's called guarantee payments. Um, and your accountant can help you work with that. We work with the accountants to make sure you get your guarantee payments are set up correctly so you can get a regular paycheck. Uh, it can be, as I said, a little expensive to form. Many states have some additional taxation for them. Uh, it became, you know, 1970, they've been around since 1977. The Okay. I'm sorry, I just went blank. Okay. Oh, I love when that happens. It's so horrible. No, no, no. Um, I had a really good point to make, and it's not in my notes, but it's fine. Okay. Um, Still thinking. Thing about, oh, I guess it only took me a second. I'm not that old yet. The thing I really like and most people like about limited liability companies is that unlike corporations, you don't have to have meetings. You don't have to have reams of paper. You don't have to do that. You can, and many do, just to document what they're doing, but it's not a requirement. You're not forced to have member meetings. You're not forced to have boards of directors. Technically, you don't. You have a board of managers. They don't have to have regular meetings. So it's a lot. You get the same benefit of limited liability that you get with a corporation with a lot less of the aggravation and the hassle. And that's why a lot of small businesses are using it. Anthony, why does the legislature make you have to do the required publications? I always get that question and I don't know their answer. What is that about? I, I really never do dove into it only because it is what it is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have a joke around my office. It's called the blue whale. Uh, the blue whale is the largest animal on the face of the planet. Its throat is only this big. You know why? Because that's the way it is. Right. I think the reason they did it was it maybe initially limited liability companies were so different from corporations that they wanted, they wanted people to publicize it. But I, I don't really have any answer to that. I know. I, I know. I, I also say that it sometimes can't two corporations become an LLC together. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought maybe it's like for, for full disclosure or something. I don't no. know. It is, it is some sort of disclosure issue, but remember, you're talking about 1977, and I don't, I don't really understand, and I never really bothered to look into why there's a publication. I, I don't do it. Like, I don't have enough to do. I'm okay. glad you said that, because uh, nobody knows, seems to know the answer. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Um, it's not all roses, though. You know, you can have liability as a, a limited liability company member under certain scenarios. And as I said, you personally guarantee a loan, right? You've signed something. You don't pay employment taxes, right? You're always gonna be responsible for, for certain taxes that the government seeks to collect. You, um, you engage in some sort of fraud or illegal behavior. You don't treat the company again as a separate legal entity. So you use company assets for your own benefit, right? Um, company, the company rents a car and you use the car. 
yeah, we all do it. Everybody does it. But you're used, you, is anything that looks like you're blurring the lines between the LLC and you pushes you closer to, just as it does with the corporation, somebody saying to you, you're really not acting in, a, in an LLC form. The difference is you don't have to do all the other nonsense that the legislature requires. And it makes sense to me, and it may not make sense to you, but I'll explain it. If the legislature is allowing you to limit liability the way it does with the corporation, you need to get the benefits of being a corporation, you need to give something back. There's a cost for that. And the cost is all of these requirements. The last thing about an LLC, and, and it's distinctly not a corporation, it says in the LLC law, virtually every provision says, unless otherwise provided in the operating agreement, blah, blah, blah. So you can modify and do pretty much what you want in an LLC in terms of management and operation. That's the good news. The bad news is it's a little bit like the mob. LL There's no provision in the limited liability company law for dissolving an LLC. And the courts have taken the position, oh, Ronnie, Anthony, is the business running? Yeah. Okay. So it's kind of like hating your spouse and being unable to get a divorce. LLCs, so you really need a limited an operating agreement to be able to separate because absent that, the courts are not going to help you and you're going to be stuck as an LLC member. Wow. Okay. That's the one, that's the one big drawback. You don't get that. There's, there's literally centuries old provisions that deal with what happens when a shareholder is being oppressed by other minorities being oppressed by majority and what your rights are and what your remedies are and how you get out and how you can sell and how you can dissolve. There's none of that in the LLC. And the courts are not reading that into it. And with that. So with the corporation, let me ask you this. If you have a, a wife and the husband is the part is the business person, but he dies. So the wife is still part of the corporation, correct? Is the wife the business partner? You said if the if the husband has business partners and the husband dies, do they do these partners still have to deal with the wife? What does the operating agreement? What does the shareholders agreement say? Because shares are inherited, right? You can inherit. You know, Absent something in an agreement, shares are inherited. Mm -hmm. So now, and this comes up, Ronnie, every single time. Mm -hmm. No, Ronnie, I want to be partners with you, but I don't want to be partners with your spouse. That's why you need an operating agreement or a shareholders agreement, because those interests, either membership interests or share, share interests, can pass on to the next generation according to a will. You can say in, in an agreement, either no, they don't, on the death of, of one of the owners, we buy you out. And this becomes a bone of contention among members sometimes. We buy you out under this specific circumstance where we don't buy you out, or we have key man insurance that buys you out. And if it doesn't, it doesn't hit the, the, uh, the valuation price, then we pay you over a certain period of time. But I have had any number of business people come to me and say, I love my partner. I don't want to be partners with the spouse. Yeah. You know, this is why it's important for people to seek the advice of an attorney, because I tell people all the time, you know, write down what you want to do, write down what your agreement is, but then have an attorney look it over because there are a lot of things that you don't even know you should consider. So you really need to talk to someone who has experience. So, you know, you're, you're absolutely right. And, and again, you know me, I'm not, um, I'm not pitching, but People actually do that. And that's a really good idea. Write down all your business points, write down everything. And then what they do is they decide, you know, we did it already. We don't need a lawyer to look at this and they sign it. And it's garbage. It's not bad. It doesn't bind anybody. It's just your thoughts. You want it to be, take the next step into a binding agreement. It doesn't really cost all that much to do it. And at the end of the day, it's like the old Fram oil filter commercial. Pay me now or pay me later. And I right. will tell you that when we get this business, business divorces, I tell everybody the same thing. And maybe I'll end on that. 
those cases where you're breaking up a business begin and end in some conference room somewhere trying to work it out because what invariably happens is Leslie and Ronnie get pissed off at each other. They go to lawyers, they have a meeting, nothing happens. They sue each other. They spend, I'm not exaggerating, a quarter of a million dollars on experts and lawyers and realize, oh crap, I'm not going to let a judge decide how to do this. They don't know what they're doing. And they end up back in the conference room. It makes life a lot easier if you start your business existence in a conference room somewhere on a Zoom call, making sure that everything that could be a problem is dealt with. And most times people don't realize all the details that are involved. So it's important to go. Thank you, Anthony. Really, it's- You are more than welcome. Yeah, we still have six.